related to some of the preventable situations uh, that have led to an unacceptable number of deaths in the jail, I think uh, are just very concerning to me. And I just want to state that before getting into questions because I don't want to sort of miss the magnitude of the impact of this report. Um, why is there a blood alcohol limit no one can get all? system, the iMatch system, um, has the department made any changes to it um, to ensure potential cellmates are compatible before placing them in a cell together? What I heard was that um, your personnel uh, observed um, behavior that may have suggested to them that they could um, coexist in that space, but they aren't necessarily the medical health professionals who come in and evaluate these folks. So. Are, how are we changing the matching system to make sure that that sort of observational approach doesn't happen? So thank you. Um, to speak to that, um, you're, you're correct. They made the decision to match the two just based upon their observations and how they program together. Um, with that, they still met the same criteria for uh, their P-level status were the same, they were compatible, and their security levels were indicated they're compatible. When we look at and we refer to the IMATCH system, those two are taken into consideration as well as the height, weight of, um, of the particular inmates. And, um, and so using that criteria is where they come up with the, the suggestion or the, the, um, the 
the I should say option because not all, even though we look at the eye match and at times they may match according to paper um, and, and seem to be appropriately um, able to house together, that doesn't always sink in with their observations. So when they made the matches, it was based upon their observations. So we're not so much going to change anything in relation to the height, weight, security, um, but we're, the verdict is still out because we're still looking at other agencies and what they use to match inmates in the same cell. I just hope that when that system when that system provides information that might be vital um, as to why somebody might not be matched together, that we don't rely on what I heard you say were observations of, of compatible behavior. Um, on another topic, uh, it appears there was at least one death um, where Narcan wasn't deployed, and I believe um, it's been this board's impression um, that all custody and nursing staff have. If you would like to address item 34, if you have not already done so, please press 1 then 0 now to be placed in the speaker queue. Moderator, may we have the first speaker, please? Our first participant is Jamel Carter. You may begin. I am speaking in regards to what the internal of, uh, of Inspector General uh, Max has to say. Max has ignored my matter in regards to my complaint I filed, and I also told Ms. Mitchell, and my response from the Sheriff's Department is unresolved. I asked Max to send this over to the Board of Supervisors for another review. He has not done so. It's dated from September of 2023, but Max tells me he's done with my matter. My complaint stated I lost 10 pounds within 12 days. It's documented. And also, I was placed in the incorrect department of the sheriff's department with illegal waste restraints locked in an inside jail cell. Mitchell has ignored my matter. I asked for this report to be given to all board members. No one has responded to me, but Max also hung up the telephone and told me, we've already looked into your matter. I asked Max to give this to the board of supervisors. The report number, incident number is 22-0020. Ms. Mitchell's office, once again, does not care that African American. Thank you. Your time has expired. Moderator, next speaker, please. Our next participant is Dr. Genevieve Pavarul. You may begin. Genevieve, go ahead. Genevieve, are you there? We'll go to the next speaker, please. Thank you. Our next participant is Eric Previn. You may begin. Thank you. It's Eric Previn from Studio City. And, you know, the Civilian Oversight Report is a hallmark of county government. And I was thinking we could possibly add to it the installation of a signonometer that could be applied to each of the supervisors so that during the report we could measure the blood pressure of the supervisors. Because certainly as a member of the public who's watched the iPad inventory hover around 280 for nearly five years, I'm infuriated that Angelinos who are in behind bars can't access an iPad to make the proper complaint. And the idea that we've evolved from a flashlight uh, on the weapon, to a flashlight on the weapon, from, I don't want to upset anyone, the prior report about what the flashlight was used for, it is great progress. And I would like, since we're data-driven, how many bloody Narcan administrations are happening daily? Because I saw that the overall complaints are like, they're so modest, you can't believe it. There's only three complaints. Time has expired. Moderator, next speaker, please. Our next participant is Roy Humphreys. You may begin. Okay, uh, jails have uh, been a criminal function uh, since inception. All supervisors present and past are unindicted felons as to county jails. The board must immediately petition the state to change the California Penal Code to allow the counties to establish uh, independent corrections facilities for the counties. All supervisors and senior staff must uh, spend one day in uh, county jails until these problems are resolved and Ryan Serrano of uh, Hilda Solis' office would be more than happy to start this off. You need a $10 billion tax function to solve these problems in a timely manner. Supervisors are the problems. But all but the, uh, Supervisor Barger trashed the $1.5 billion men's jail enhancement. Uh, the supervisors continue their criminal behavior. Restructuring is essential and thank God Shul 
uh, Sheila Kuhl is gone. Thank you. Next speaker. Madam Chair, there are no additional remote speakers in queue to address the board. Thank you very much. We'll now go in person. Go right ahead. Thank you. This is an interesting item. Report by the Inspector General on reforms and oversight efforts. Report by the Inspector General on reforms and oversight efforts. You're repeating yourself. You mentioned lowering the DUI from point A to point O two, uh, Madam Solis. What about MTAs? Is there a waiver on the number of FTAs you can get if you have a DUI? Forms an oversight effort. You're repeating yourself. You mentioned lowering the DUI from point eight zero eight to point zero two, uh, Madam Solis. What about FTAs? Is there a waiver on the number of FTAs you can get if you have a DUI and you fail to go to court? Can anybody be arrested for an FTA? Do you have to be in a car? I mean, you're talking about having usage of alcohol. What if you're on the street and, and you get stopped and you have outstanding FTAs, like maybe 50 or 60 FTAs? Can any police officer, sworn police officer, take that person to court? Can they have to, do they have to appear for court? This Black Apple computer, maybe you should use a Black Apple computer to break through the, the paper ceiling. Thank you, next speaker. Suzette Shaw, Skid Row resident. Um, so they often say common sense is not common, and we see that this is a very good case of why common sense is not common. Um, as a Skid Row resident, um, I can say that this is this is this shows the systemic inequality in the issues of what's going on in our community, of how people are being housed in jails where there's such chronic. Um, uh, situations going on and then they're being brought into the communities to live in the same buildings as me as a trauma survivor because you have people who are running the system and what world does somebody get to go to work and be drunk this is intolerable how dare you even make this out to be like it's just oh it's just another day in the neighborhood what is wrong with you people what is wrong with you people this is not right this is part of the problem. You're killing people and now you're reacting. Next speaker. Thank you, your time has expired. Your time has expired. Next speaker, please. Hello, this is Donna Perriman. It seems to me you're all way over using First of all, you seem to be anti-gun. You seem to be going for a very small percentage of guns, probably with flashlight, probably had a problem with the most people doing well with that gun. And most people probably, I think she's overdoing it with the alcohol level. Most people probably do well with, the, what are you going to do? They have one dress glass of whiskey and all of a sudden you take away the gun and um, I think you're overspending money because you're doing this dog sniffing and then we're doing uh, let's spend all that money on this dog sniffers let's spend all this money on going through scanners so the employees all have to go through and delay their time by going through scanners uh, it seems to me like we're not spending our money well, just like we're not doing it with the voting machines. We're sp overspending on the voting machines. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other speakers in no person? Speakers. All right, Supervisor Barker. Yeah, I, I just wanted, I, I sidebarred because I wanted to get a clarification because I'm still blown by the fact that someone can come to work drinking. And so I want you to clarify your comment, please. Yeah, and I apologize for the misconception, but yes, there is a policy that restricts employees from coming to work drunk. Uh, discipline Under 08, even it's like 04. Uh, absolutely. Okay. Whatever the blood alcohol content is, there is a restriction that says you will not come to work drunk. And a uh, violation of that policy leads to discharge. Uh, there's also uh, policy violations uh, for operating a county vehicle. Um, under the influence of alcohol. So we do have policies in place that prevent employees from coming to work drunk, and I apologize. I would say under the influence of alcohol, not drugs. Alcohol, drugs, whatever, 
So why? No, I, I just I just, well, I'm done. So why is there an acceptable blood blood alcohol content level? That was my question for well, anyone on duty. Well, again, um, 0 0.02 is the acceptable range, only because there's been studies to prove that mouthwash. A uh, certain cough medication will cause you to have a blood alcohol content level. There's studies out there that prove that. Um, however, if the person is impaired and not able to operate a vehicle, they're obviously in violation of the policy. And what blood alcohol content level would someone have when using mouthwash? I, I don't know. But so, it is a factor in um, perhaps adjusting your blood alcohol content level when measured. Understood. And the there's also an acceptable blood alcohol content level uh, for someone who's off duty. And again, I think uh, really the spirit of my questions is why there's a limit at all. Because I think that, you know, members of the public would expect that someone who's operating a firearm on or off duty wouldn't be under the influence of alcohol. And I think it opens us up to liability. It can create concerning um, situations and certainly reduce public trust if we're allowing people to be operating firearms um, while they're while they've consumed alcohol especially when members of the public are held, would be held to a different standard Madam Chair. I, Ma Supervisor Mitchell then I just need clarification so what is it in the OIG report that the department has refused to um, adopt not none that's all so that's off-duty? Is that what the OIG report? The, the primary focus of our report has to do with off-duty behavior. Mm -hmm. This question regarding on-duty behavior, uh, which I think is correctly being discussed, uh, isn't the focus. However, one of our recommendations has to do with the criteria whereby you start asking or, or taking a test. And although it may be that you're not supposed to be under the influence on duty while you have a gun, there isn't a policy that triggers an inquiry when there's when there's appropriate uh, an appropriate question level, and that's one of our recommendations that we have not had a response to. That's why I think it's it's coming to our discussion. Primarily, the report is about off-duty behavior. It is deeply troubling to be having a conversation about alcohol um, influence of alcohol while on duty. <laughs> All right, the report is received and filed. Hearing no objections, that will be the order. We will now move on to item 56A, establishing the Antelope Valley Water Plan, Water Supply Reliability for Sustainable Growth, which was held by Supervisor Barger. For members of the public on the telephone, please press one then zero now to comment on this item. Supervisor Barger, I'll turn it to you. Thank you. As we heard earlier today um, when we discussed my motion on the Center for Transportation Technology Excellence, the future of the Antelope Valley is quite bright. A number of new and existing industries are hoping to open new businesses, develop new housing, and invest in the local economy. Collectively, working with the cities of Lancaster and Palmdale, I'm eager to support this growth. Sustainable and equitable development that supports all residents, particularly lower income and disadvantaged communities, is crucial to ensure a brighter future for all. The Antelope Valley is home to major industries including aerospace, logistics, healthcare, education, along with the growing service sector. Forecast for the Antelope Valley Economic Develop from the Antelope Valley Economic Development and Growth Enterprise, also known as AV Edge, noted a need to focus on job creation with living wages. These new jobs and industries are going to allow 